So it's my pleasure to take us through the, the last seven short talks of the day. We're going to split that into two pieces. We're going to do four talks followed by three talks. And then, as you've seen in your program, we have a reception after that. So stick around. There's not a whole lot for me to do because Ed has done such a great job with the, the presentations. But I think we're ready for our first speaker. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm Savas Loizzo, I'm from the Cyprus University of Technology, and uh, I'm going to present my work on the multi-agent navigation transformation uh, and uh, tuning-free multi-robot navigation. So, uh, navigation functions have been, uh, are arguably, uh, arguably one of the most successful frameworks for uh, robotic navigation. And this is uh, basically due to the fact that they provide uh, analytically uh, guaranteed performance uh, to the closed form fast feedback based navigation uh, problem. Now, uh, during the last uh, decade, we have seen uh, attempts to extend the navigation functions to the case of multiple robots uh, with uh, uh, a relevant success. However, uh, these uh, extensions have inherited both the good and uh, the bad traits of navigation functions. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, uh, there are some additional problems that appeared in the multi-robot navigation functions uh, literature. So uh, this is the motivation for this work, where we're actually uh, tackling the inherited uh, problems that have to do with the tuning, where we, uh, in navigation functions you are actually constructing uh, a candidate navigation function, and by tuning you are trying to eliminate the local minima, and uh, with additional tuning, you are trying to uh, make this local minima to be uh, non-degenerate. Uh, of course, this uh, uh, gives you a problem of adding and removing obstacles. And also, uh, you, you have to handle arbitrarily shaped workspace entities and uh, obstacles. And up to now, in the literature, we have only seen disk-shaped uh, objects. So the problem that uh, we are uh, tackling uh, is to uh, create decentralized feedback uh, control uh, laws for each arbitrarily shaped uh, uh, robot that is uh, if, uh, operating in a workspace with arbitrarily shaped obstacles and arbitrarily shaped uh, robots. So we are assuming uh, holonomic kinematics uh, for uh, the robots. And uh, we have two assumptions that are um, about the destination configurations and the existence of smooth distance uh, metrics. So, uh, if you try to tackle this problem, you will see that there is a major issue that has to do uh, with the time-varying topology. So, we have the Euler characteristic of our workspace that is changing, and this is because we have uh, grown uh, workspace entities that are moving and intersecting other entities. So, we have to uh, develop an appropriate uh, transformation that will map this uh, topology to uh, uh, an appropriate domain where we can construct a harmonic function-based navigation function, which will give us a correct by construction uh, solution without the need to tune at least for the local minima. So the idea uh, here, the intuition, is that we want to exploit the underlying uh, graph that is created by the intersecting grown entities and uh, perform uh, an adsorption uh, transformation to map uh, those intersecting workspace entities to a single entity uh, in a single point in the point uh, world. So um, the idea here is that uh, basically this uh, multi-agent navigation transformation that is proposed in this paper uh, is a, def a diffeomorphism from the interior of your workspace to uh, the point world. So this is performed by first uh, creating the underlying graph of uh, your intersecting of your growing intersecting workspace entities, then uh, creating the um, the spanning tree of the of each connected component, determining the center of the graph, and uh, uh, routing the graph at its graph center, uh, then assigning a sync to the graph uh, uh, to the center of the tree uh, creates an implied uh, orientation of your uh, uh, tree. And uh, then with adsorption transformation, you get the multi agent navigation transformation. So the, uh, our results here state that with uh, the given assumptions about the 
destination configurations and the existence of, um, of smooth distance metrics from the, uh, uh, from the entities, uh, we have created a control and parameter update loss for each robot that they can guarantee us global asymptotical, uh, global asymptotic stability up to a set of measure zero of uh, initial conditions. So, thank you very much, and uh, I would be happy to uh, discuss further at the interactive section. Hi, my name is Christian Vasile, and I will present an automatic theory approach uh, to the vehicle routing problem. Consider a mission where we deploy two robots in an environment with a number of sites and charging stations, such as the one on the right, where the robots can move in between the charging stations and the sites. We extract from this uh, uh, transition system where the ways represent travel times between those nodes. And we define collision between vehicles when uh, two vehicles are at the same node or are tra traversing the same edge or a vehicle arrives at a, a node less than t call seconds after the departure of another node, uh, vehicle from the same node. We also assume that the robots have a limited amount of uh, resources such as fuel or battery, and we define the maximum op uh, operation time of a vehicle and uh, the charging time starting with an empty battery. For all these uh, vehicles and for all time, we define the battery state such that it is between 0 and TCH, and we have an update uh, rule which uh, models charging and discharging. Now, we also define a new uh, specification language called Time Window Temporal Logic, uh, TWTL for short, which has bounded time semantics. That means that given a formula, we can say before the maximum time we need to uh, satisfy it. The overall mission specification is to satisfy such a TWTL formula infinitely often. And notice that the specification is only on the set of sites because the uh, framework takes care of the charging constraints. Now, given all these elements, we want to find the feasible control policy that satisfies G5. And what we mean by the feasible control policy, one where the, uh, the battery states for all robots and for all time never goes below zero, the vehicles are always in pairwise collision-free states. Additionally, we uh, also... Uh, consider optimality with respect to loop time, and we have uh, a number of cost functions related to this that we consider in this framework. Now, the main contribution is the introduction of the uh, persistent VIP problem, VRP problem, which extends the uh, vehicle routing problem with time windows. We have rich temporal logic specification, which have infinite time semantics, and within each loop we have uh, time bounds. We consider resource constraints, asymptotic optimality with criteria with respect to the loop time. We allow vehicles to revisit sites if it is imposed by the specification as opposed to classical VRP, and we explicitly deal with collision avoidance. The approach is based on automata theory, uh, and we first start with uh, the transition system which models the motion of a single robot, and we produce a product automaton a transition system that captures the motion of all the robots at the same time. And we do this in two ways. A mutually exclusive mode where one uh, vehicle is active at uh, time and a fully concurrent mode where we have no restrictions on the motion. Charging and specifications are each encoded as finite state automata and we produce a product automaton on which we solve the completeness and optimality problems. Now, in the following, we'll show a, a video of uh, an experiment where the uh, first quadrotor will uh, go to service site A for two seconds, and then will go to site C and service it for uh, three seconds. It is required to do so in uh, some uh, time window. It will uh, then land on charging station three. The second quadrotor will finish the mission by going and servicing the third uh, site, and then it within 10 seconds, it will have to go to either A or C and service uh, one of them for two seconds. In this uh, particular uh, loop, it will uh, choose to go to site A and service it. In the end, it will uh, land on charging station one. And notice that 
the uh, robots are in a different configuration than the, uh, the beginning of the loop. And this is important because in the next loop, they have to do this all over again. And we'll see the second loop. In this loop, the second quadrotor will start uh, the mission, and the first quadrotor will finish it. Now, uh, in this loop, the, uh, both quadrotors will be in the same uh, configuration, and so the, uh, they can execute this loop infinitely many times, thus satisfying the overall mission specification. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ali Sape from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and today I'll be talking about effective task training strategies for instructional robots. Humans often engage in a variety of instructional tasks on a daily basis. For example, a mechanic might train a new employee on a particular maintenance task, or a student might help out their partner in lab with what step comes next in an experimental protocol. In these tasks, we often refer to the person giving instructions as the instructor and the person acting on the instructions as the student. Similarly, in the future, we expect that robots will fulfill a number of instructional roles in society, where they will be expected to guide humans through a series of steps in a task, such as tutoring students or providing instruction in a particular exercise. These roles will require that robots engage in two different aspects of instructing, giving effective instructions and providing accurate and descriptive corrections to mistakes. The inability to implement either of these skills could lead to mistakes in completing the task, as well as confused human workers. So, for example, we're going to see a video where the robot will first give a single instruction, and the student will uh, complete this instruction incorrectly. Afterwards, the robot is going to give multiple instructions, confusing the student. So here we see the robot starting to give an instruction about taking an elbow joint and adding it to the pipe that's immediately in front of the robot. However, the student takes a T-shaped joint instead and adds it to the pipe. The robot doesn't notice and proceeds by giving a series of instructions. These instructions uh, are multiple and involve a variety of different pieces in the task, uh, confusing the human worker. So you can see that the student is looking for different pieces and trying to figure out what they should be taking to add to the setup that's currently there. <laughs> to better understand uh, how we can create more effective robots, we first looked at human-human interactions in an instructional task in a laboratory setting to understand how instructors both give instructions as well as correct mistakes. Regarding giving instructions, we discovered two dimensions, grouping and summarizing, along which instructions can vary. Here, grouping indicates whether one or multiple instructions are given at a time, while summarizing indicates whether the instructor first summarizes what the outcome of the following instructions should be. Regarding correcting mistakes, uh, we developed a policy for uh, correcting mistakes from both our human-human data as well as the literature, such as being able to talk about when to flip a pipe. We then implemented both our instructional strategies as well as our uh, correction policy on a robot, who then guided human students through the pipe building task, correcting mistakes as necessary. Participants were assigned to one of the four possible instructional strategies discussed earlier. We'll see an example in the following video of our resulting model. Like before, the robot will first give an instruction and the human will still make a mistake. But this time, the robot will notice and correct the mistake. Afterwards, the robot will give multiple instructions. The confused student will then ask for repetition of the second instruction in order to correctly complete the task. So here we see the robot again giving the first instru or same instruction that we saw last time about the elbow joint. And again, the student makes a mistake by adding the T-shaped joint. This time, the robot checks, notices the incorrect joint, and points out the error to the student, who can then correct the mistake by taking off the T-shaped joint and adding the elbow joint. Once it's correct, the robot then moves on to giving the same three instructions that we saw in the previous video, where it involves multiple different types of pipes and joints. And so the student picks out the first pipe that they need uh, and gets to adding it, but then misses what the rest of the instructions are. And so we'll eventually end up asking a question to repeat for the second instruction. The robot then goes ahead and repeats the second instruction, allowing the student to go ahead and find the uh, correct pipe and joint and add the remaining pieces to correctly complete the task. 
To hear more about our model for both giving instructions as well as correcting mistakes and the results of our evaluation, come see our poster tomorrow morning during the first coffee break. Thank you. Hi, my name is Paul Vernazza. Uh, this is work I did with Tony Stentz uh, at CMU, uh, particularly the National Robotics Engineering Center. Okay, so the basic problem is very simple. Uh, basically, we want to teach a robot to locate things efficiently in novel environments. Uh, so in the paper, we considered this problem of an elder elderly care scenario, uh, where basically uh, we want to locate grandma's glasses for her efficiently or her purse or whatever. Um, and so the way we approach this problem is as a learning from demonstration problem, or more specifically, as an inverse optimal control problem. So what that means is uh, we're going to have a human demonstrator, and we're going to show the demonstrator a sequence of environments, and we're going to ask them how they would most efficiently locate the target in each environment. Okay? And their answer is going to be in the form of an optimal search tour. Okay? So what this implies is that the human must have some latent prior belief over the, where they believe the target uh, might be located. And so what we're going to try to do in learning is we're going to try to both back out that prior, but we're going to do back out that prior in a way that generalizes across environments. Okay, so to be a little more specific, um, you can think of this as a sort of almost a, a latent logistic regression approach if you're familiar with that. So, so what I mean by that is at each location we have a feature vector illustrated by these kind of bar graphs. Uh, and then we assume that the pro log probability of the target being at each location is proportional to the dot product between the feature vector and a uh, weight vector to be learned. Okay, so logistic regression would be the model where we just assume we observe a sample from this target probability distribution, right? But we don't actually ever get to observe where the target was actually located. All we have are these paths, right? So you can think of it instead as this latent logistic regression model where instead of observing this distribution directly, we observe some complicated function of this distribution, which happens to be an optimal search tour with respect to this distribution. So this is just an illustration of how the learning procedure works. Uh, on the left here at each location, so this is actually a training example, uh, we have a description environment of an environment. At each location, we have a histogram representing a feature vector at that location. And then we have an optimal search tour uh, provided by the demonstrator. On the right here, you have the output of our learning algorithm in time. Uh, so what we're, do is, what we're doing is we're learning a sequence of weight vectors here. Uh, and you'll see a cyan circle over on the right indicating uh, our current prior, right? So that's just, again, the e to the location features with the weight vector. And then what we're doing is we're doing this simple alternating optimization where basically we fix a weight vector, we compute the priors, given the priors we compute an optimal search tour, and if it disagrees with our training path in some way, then we update the weights according to this error signal up here. So uh, a significant contribution of the paper we think is giving a nice way to solve this uh, expected time optimal uh, search problem. And uh, we're not the first people to address this problem, but we think we have uh, integrated some interesting novel uh, approaches. So it's, it's difficult because this is actually an MP-hard uh, optimization problem. It's, you can think of it as not only a traveling salesman problem, but a stochastic traveling salesman problem. Uh, and so we introduced this graph search framework in which to address this problem. And the nice thing about the graph search framework is that you can apply nice tricks like A star, right, to so that you can apply heuristics to find the optimal solution uh, to this problem. And we also introduced some novel heuristics that are actually based on relaxations of the problem. Uh, and the nice thing about that is that since we're exactly solving relaxed versions of the problem, we get these nice admissible heuristics so that when we run A star, we'll actually find the optimal solution. And finally, here are some qualitative results. Uh, so this is demonstrating an actually a uh, synthetic kind of experiment where we began with some ad hoc latent prior, and given that latent prior, we generated optimal search tours, and then we fed these optimal search tours to our learning algorithm as training data. And what's nice about uh, doing things this way is that we can actually then uh, reconstruct the training priors uh, on novel environments, on the held out environments, 
and we can actually see how well we did at reconstructing the training priors and generalizing to a novel environment. And as you can see, we do a surprising, surprisingly well job of reconstructing the prior. It's almost spot on in a lot of cases. Uh, so if you want more details, please stop by my poster at D5 tomorrow. Thanks. So now we have five minutes for questions for the first four papers, uh, which we have up here. So do we have any questions? Hi, this is a question for Paul. Um, so I, I do some inverse optimal control stuff myself, and one thing that sort of keeps me up awake at night is what if grandma is not optimal? Um, so you know, you're presuming optimality. How bad do things get? How, how gnarled does, does your algorithm get if, uh, if you get sort of demonstrably suboptimal demonstrations? Uh, that's a great question, and so one way we can address this is, uh, so just like computers, uh, people are bad at solving this problem when it scales up to really large problems, uh, but what we can, we can address this is we can actually demonstrate, uh, we can have the humans demonstrate on a smaller environment where it's really obvious what the solution is, and then we can actually generalize to a larger environment. Uh, but it's an open problem, you know, this how, like what do we do in case uh, the human can't actually do an optimal demonstration. Question to Alison: uh, do, do, do you make any assumption on the uh, when giving the instruction to the uh, to the per person who is teaching? Um, so we don't really make any assumptions in how we give the instructions. We the instructions we gave in this particular task uh, were all fully complete, and that they gave all the details necessary uh, <laughs> to complete the instruction. Um, usually when we saw mistakes, it seemed to be because of either misunderstanding or maybe becoming overwhelmed by the number of uh, instructions given, rather than anything missing from the instructions. Do we have another question? Okay, if we don't, then I'm going to be greedy and ask Savas a question. Um, so you've looked at the, you've looked at, you'll need to take my microphone, you've looked at the um, case where you're building these, uh, uh, th these navigation functions uh, in the case where you're adding obstacles and you're removing them and that the one thing that you said is you have this assumption that uh, there's no impasse which blocks the uh, I believe this was one of the assumptions you listed and my, I my guess my question is this begs the question of whether you can get to the point of maybe looking at slightly deformable objects if they satisfy some set of of objects or something along uh, uh, <coughs> some assumptions along this way absolutely uh, actually th this is uh, possible and this is something that, that I'm looking into uh, so the, the thing is that you need the transformation uh, to take into account this um, uh, this change. Uh, so uh, this uh, should be uh, in, in principle possible under under this uh, framework. But it's something that I'm I'm looking into. Excellent. I think we have time for one more. All right. All right. And then, in the interest of ba balance, I will ask our other speaker, um, Christian, if you could. Uh, Tell me, you mentioned something uh, in the specification. You were saying one of the things you have is that you note the specifications over the sites, not over the, the, the routes to get to those sites. And I wasn't quite sure if that was a simplification. Or if you're saying no, that... It's, it's not a simplification. So uh, we defined a, um, uh, the mission specification over the sites because the charging stations are part of the uh, charging process. So we handle that automatically uh, in the framework. So we don't want the user to worry about that. We just need a, a functional mission specification for where to go and what to do. So not to right. care uh, about when to go to the charging stations. All right. Excellent. Do we, anyone got a quick question? Okay, then in the interest of time, let's uh, give a, a round of applause and we'll have a, our next speaker on. Um, hello, everyone. Um, our work is about modeling high-dimensional humans for activity anticipation uh, using Gaussian process latent CRFs. I'm Yun Jiang, and this is a joint work with Asha Saxena from Cornell University. So modeling humans has always been an important problem for robots working in our environments. Uh, therefore, we have designed many different ways to represent humans. For example, on the uh, left end of the spectrum, a low dimensional representation uh, can be as simple as a text label or a 2D trajectory. Such simple representation is convenient for tasks such as navigation, symbolic planning, or human robot collaboration. A slightly more detailed model would include basic joints and limbs of our body, which is typically used for tracking, seeing understanding, and anticipation. 
On the other end of the spectrum, a very complicated human model can carry information of every bones, muscles, and joints of our body, which can lead to tens of hundreds of dimensions of data to specify just one static pose. Such high dimensional representation is often used for uh, reconstructing motion, animation, and the low-level planning. So different representations are not, not only used in different applications, but they are also chosen for different algorithms. For example, uh, the low dimensional representation is typically used in machine learning algorithms such as HMM, MDP, or Kalman filter. This is due to its compact representation of the state space, and it, it can also help to avoid overfitting the data. On the other hand, high dimensional representation is often required for computing geometry, such as calculating inverse kinematics or check collision and feasibility of generated human pose. However, in many situations, we want to have both low dimensional and high dimensional representations. For example, in this work, we consider the task of anticipating human activity. So we want to have low dimensional representation to quickly infer the future state of humans, while at the same time have the high dimensional representation uh, to generate realistic human motions. So motivated by these two different representations, in this work, we propose a model that combines the best of two. So in this work, our model takes an RGBD video as input, such as shown here, and we use computer vision techniques to track objects and humans in the video. We use a graphic model, CRF, to model uh, the activity, objects, and humans as the nodes in the graph and their relations as edges. So in this way, we can capture the rich context in the scene and use it to infer the future activities and humans. However, modeling human-human relations under the high dimensional space can be very challenging. It can lead to overfitting and also high dimensionality means the search space for future possible human poses is extremely large, thus making the inference very inefficient. So we propose uh, to integrate a Gaussian process into our model that can learn a mapping from the original high dimensional space H to a latent low dimensional space X. And in this low dimensional space, we can easily model the human-human relations and use it to infer future human state XT prime as well as to generate realistic human motions HT prime. We test our model on a Cornell activity data set which has four subjects performing different activities in a variety of uh, environments. And our tasks are to predict future activities, object affordances, and human trajectories. Our model achieves the best results in all these tasks, especially it reduces human trajectory error by as much as 10%. So now let's look at two examples of generated human motions. On the left, we have uh, the previous method predicts an out-of-reach pose, which is touching the ground. However, our method, by considering high-dimensional human model, can guarantee to generate only valid poses. Therefore, it predicts an eating action instead. On the right, uh, the previous method predicts a discontinuous trajectory, where the subject was opening a microwave door, but suddenly he starts to move moving the hand to the mouth. On the contrary, our mo model can learn a continuity in the trajectory in the low dimensional space. And therefore, it predicts the hand would keep pushing the door until it, it is fully opened. For more details, please come to our post session tomorrow morning. Thank you. Welcome to my talk, Manhattan and Piecewise Planar Constraints for Dense Molecular Mapping. This is okay. okay. This is the problem we are dealing with, given a sequence of images. We want to estimate a 3D dense map of the environment. PTAM is a visual slam system that maps key points between keyframes, triangulates the key points, and minimizes the reproduction error of the key points using bundle adjustment. The main limitation of the system is that this is not dense, as you can see in the 3D map. A more, a more recent work called DTAM has densified the reconstructions. It minimizes a functional over the whole image, which is, a, which is composed of two terms, a photometric consistency term and a regularizer, which smooths the surface created. 
And as you can see in the right in the image, the reconstruction is quite accurate in this high texture environment. But if we go to a low texture environment in our lab, you can see that the walls get corrupted because the walls are low texture and the photometric term is not informative. So our motivation is to do 3D mapping for situation for low and high texture environments. We use planar constraints for the low texture areas and we have used two approaches to calculate these planar constraints. The first one is the Manhattan approach and the second one the piecewise planar approach. For the first one, we have used the layout of, the, of a room. The input are a sequence of images and the output is, is the label for every pixel. It labels every pixel as a wall or as an object. And also the output is the 3D estimation of the layout, which will be our planar constraint in the pixels that are labeled as a wall. The other approach is to use piecewise planar constraints. We calculate super pixels between different views, as you can see now. And we calculate the contour of the superpixel, which will be our descriptor. We assume that superpixels will lie on a plane, so we use a homography model and we minimize the contour reproduction error, which are the yellow arrows. The variables to optimize are the normal and the distance to the origin of the homography. Now you will see the, the 3D reconstruction of the large and textured superpixels. which are this one, and this will be our planar constraint. This is the variation of formulation that we propose. The first term is the photometric consistency term between different views. The second term is the regularizer that smooths the surface. And the third term is our contribution is the planar constraint, which comes from either the Manhattan layout or the, multi or, or the super pixels. This is a large scale experiment, a room size scenario. In the fourth column, you can see the ground truth depth coming from Kinet. In the fifth column is the solution of the standard DTAM with some defects in the walls. The sixth column is DTAM using super pixels as a constraint, which is the most accurate. And the last column is DTAM using the layout, which is also more accurate than standard DTAM. This is the same experiment, but in the video. This is the image sequence that we took in our lab. And now you will see the, the solution for standard DTAM without planar constraints. You can see that there are some defects in the walls and the median depth error is quite high, is 27 centimeters. Now if we use the layout of a room as a constraint, the median of the depth error is reduced to 13 centimeters. And finally, if we use piecewise planar constraints, super pixels, the median of the depth error is finally reduced to 5 centimeters. And as you can, and as you can notice, the reconstruction is accurate in the low texture areas or in the walls and in the high texture areas or the desktops. These are some outdoor results. As you can see, the walls are fixed using the piecewise planar constraints. These are some quantitative results in small scale experiments. As you can see in the table below, we always perform over outperform DTAM performance. And finally, to conclude, room understanding or layout is less accurate than multi view superficial geometry but provides an interesting semantic information that we go on to exploit as a future work. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. My name is, uh, can you hear me? My name is David Escaramuzza from the University of Zurich, and today I'm going to talk about uh, appearance based active monocular dense reconstruction for micro aerial vehicles, which is a work by my students Christian Forsten and Mattia. So, in the last ICRA conference, we presented an approach for monocular dense reconstruction that we applied to uh, uh, microaerial vehicles. In particular, what we were able to do to, was to compute in real time both the depth and the uncertainty of each pixel belonging to a certain reference image. The problem was that the trajectory, or the optimal trajectory, was uh, selected manually by the user. 
Instead, here we are trying to tackle the following research question, which is, what's the optimal motion to reconstruct them maps from a monocular camera attached to a flying robot? And so the inspiration uh, to this work came actually from the video attached to the uh, paper of uh, DITAM by Richard Newcomb, Lovegrove, and uh, uh, Andrew Davison, where basically the users were moving a camera, so the camera was handheld, and they were showing real-time monocular density reconstruction. Now I want to ask you a question. Do you notice anything interesting about the motion of the camera? Probably, as uh, most of you probably have noticed, the user is always moving the camera in a circle. The reason for doing that is that the user is trying to span uniformly all the bipolar lines such that a reliable stereo matching is achieved between consecutive viewpoints. So the question was, how should then a robot-mounted camera move to allow optimal dense 3D reconstruction? The answer, as you understand, it depends strongly on the image appearance of the scene that the robot is observing. So, most of the work that has been done on uh, optimal uh, um, reconstruction of objects and scenes with the, with the sensors has been in the, in, the, in the context of active perception and has been known in the robotics and computer vision communities as a view path planning or next best view. But typically, the problem is that often the motion of the sensor was constrained on a sphere about uh, the object of interest. And only in the last uh, years, uh, active uh, visual slam exploration strategies have been developed. The problem is that all these state-of-the-art approaches only retain geometric information while discarding the scene appearance, so the texture information. Instead, uh, what we aim in our paper is to maximize the expected information gain on the basis of both the scene structure and the appearance of the scene. And we do this by formalizing the expected information gain as a function of the photometric disparity uncertainty, which, uh, if you want, is calculated as a function of the second moment matrix of the Harris detector. So the intuitive reason behind that is that uh, in order to achieve reliable matching, you should have a strong, a, an image containing a strong image gradient. So the point is that uh, uh, the, sh the gradient direction should then be taken into account when generating optical motions that uh, are suitable for depth estimation. For example, on the right side, you see a corn field with a dominant gradient direction. So we expect that the information gain is maximum on the perpendicular direction. So we devised several control strategies, and then in the end, we found that the receding horizon control strategy is better performing. In particular, what we do is that uh, we uh, parameterize the trajectories with the BSP lines, and we use uh, three control points uh, in order to reduce the search space of, uh, of the expected information gain. And finally, we evaluated our approach on both simulated and, uh, real, and uh, real experiments. What you can see in this video is a real-time ac monocular active dense reconstruction from a, quadrotor, uh, from a quadrotor point of view. So the quadrotor is only using a single down-looking camera and is actively generating trajectories that maximize the uh, information gain over the next eight viewpoints. So, in green dots, we denote the, the predicted uh, viewpoints, while in magenta, we denote the uncertainty estimate of the, the depth. So here, the information gain is calculated, as I was saying before, as a function of the photometric disparity uncertainty. And when the helicopter reaches the next waypoint, of course, when the new image is acquired, the depth map is then updated and the full trajectory, the optimal trajectory, is then recomputed completely, immediately. And then finally, what we did is that we put the helicopter over a striped scene, and as expected, the helicopter was moving perpendicular to the stripes. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation, and if you want to know the details, please uh, read the papers or come tomorrow morning to my poster session. Thank you. Hey, it's for uh, Davide. Uh, can you say a little more about the, the planning problem that you face, uh, in particular, is it, uh, how, do you, how do you plan these eight steps that you mentioned? So, um, so we, have a we have implemented five different control strategies. We have a grid uh, control strategy, random walk. So in the grid control, basically, it's a, it's a gradient descent with a fixed step size. Instead, we have the next best view, where basically it's a variable step size. Then we have the circular motion trajectory, with which we also evaluate with a fixed radius. And then we evaluate this one, where basically, as I was saying, what we do is that uh, um, we use a receding horizon control strategy where basically we uh, calculate the expected information gain as a, a function of the next uh, best views. 
Now the problem will become expo com uh, exponential, uh, computational exponential. So in order to s simplify this and also uh, generate motion trajectories that are suitable for the aerial robots, we uh, simplify this uh, to BISP lines, okay, in order to favor the dynamics of the quadrotor. And then what we do is that uh, we, we parameterize these P-lines with the three control points, and then uh, we basically assume that the waypoints are equidistantly spaced along this P-line. Yeah, also, follow-up question on that to, to Davide. So there's a nice idea of using the texture in order to generate uh, the trajectory according to the gradients. Um, I have I kind of missed how you take into account the geometry, because you claim to do both appearance and geometry. So um, the point is that, okay, the, uh, the way we calculate the, the disparity, the, sorry, the, the point depth is both uh, based uh, on the uh, stereo uh, matching approaches. So what we do is that we have a reference image. I don't know if you're familiar with stereo, uh, multi-view stereo. We have a reference image. Uh, initially, we assume that we have the, that, um, the, um, the uncertainty is basically uniformly distributed. Then as we start moving, we basically triangulate this. Now, typically, what, uh, the way this is done is that uh, when a new image, the new, uh, when the feature is it observed in this next uh, frame, you assume in the standard approaches that the uncertainty is just uh, due to image noise. So it's basically equal to one pixel, sequence is equal to one pixel. While here, we assume that that basically is, uh, um, if you want, the proportional to um, the ellipsoid, which is associated to the uh, Harris detector second moment matrix, so which takes also the, the texture into account. So it's a sum of both. So you're basically okay. simulating the first operator yes. for every pixel. Yes. Okay. Yes. Am I correct? Was there a question up there, or was that a miscommunication? Up there. Oh, I see. Okay. Do do we have another question? Okay. So then I have a question for the f first speaker. Um, so it's n it's not. To me, it's not obvious that I would think about using a generative model if I were thinking about activity modeling, and that's the approach that you've taken and shown quite successfully here. So maybe you could tell me a little about sort of the intuition behind why you took that modeling approach. Why a generative strategy in particular? Um, um, I think um, our model is actually not a generative model, it's a probabilistic okay. model. Um, so what we want to do is um, we want to capture these relationships between human objects and activities. So to capture this context going on in the scene, uh, we use this probabilistic model called CRF. And um, yeah, this is our motivation.